All right, good morning and welcome everyone. Could you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Some people have their cameras on. If you can hear me, that would be great, excellent. So welcome everyone and thank you for being patient while we are letting people in. Ariane, can you keep letting people in from the waiting room while we're chatting here? Absolutely, you got it. Awesome. So my name is Mrs. Legassi and I am the lead educator at Joyful Learning. I started Joyful Learning as, as Learn Fort Langley about a year ago, but I have done over 100 virtual field trips in the last year. And this one is by far the largest one I have ever done. And I am so excited to be here with you guys today. So I am Mrs. Legassi and Ariane is going to introduce herself. Ariane is from Simbi. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Ariane. I am a teacher as well, but I also work at Simbi on some really cool community events. Um, and so we're working with Haley, or sorry, Mrs. Legassi today uh, and Ken Nesbitt to bring this really awesome field trip to you today. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Simbi later, but just as a snapshot, Simbi is a really neat reading program that lets you use your voice to help other kids around the world as you read. So more on that later, but that's just a little snapshot and I'll pass it back to Mrs. Legassi so she can get us rolling. Sounds good. So I would love it if we could all give a nice warm welcome to Ken who will introduce himself and do some, read some poems for us. All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hey, my name is Ken Nesbitt. And you know what? They invited me to come today because they told me it was World Read Loud Day. And I love reading really loud. And then I found out it was actually World Read Aloud Day. But I thought, oh, I could do that too. So let me introduce myself. My name is Ken Nesbitt, and I'm an author. Uh, which really just means I'm, I'm a person who likes to write books. Uh, in fact, let me show you my books. Hold on, I'm gonna put this up on the screen here so you everybody can see. And what we're gonna be doing today is I'm gonna be talking to you about how to become an author because uh, I, I'll show you how I became an author because I know that some of you might want to become authors and you can, and I will show you how I, how I did it. But I want to start by showing you what it is that I write because see, I have written loads and loads and loads of books. Now, most of my books have been these books of funny poems, right? Books like The Tidy Whitey Spider and The Armpit of Doom and My Cat Knows Karate and stuff like that. Now, I have written some other books as well, books that are not poems. Uh, for example, I wrote this little picture book, this little story book called More Bears, and it's like really cute. Um, I even wrote a bedtime book for babies called Kiff Kiff Goodnight. Wah! Yeah. Oh, and my newest book of all is this one here. Uh, you probably don't want to read it because it's actually written for kindergartners who are just learning how to read. It's called Pup and Duck. Let's play ball. Oh, and one last thing before I start sharing some poems and stuff. If you want to read some really, really, really funny stuff, but maybe you don't have any of my books or you don't want to have to go to the library, all you have to do is drop by my website. Uh, it is called poetryforkids.com. And when you visit, just be sure to click on that guy right there because that's where I keep all the funny poems. There's always at least a hundred funny poems right there. And I put up a new one every single week. Okay, so enough about that. Um, I'm gonna tell you how I became an author, but and I'm gonna show you where you can get ideas, but I wanna talk to you about, well, you know, what does it mean to be an author? How do you become an author? Well, it's actually easier than you think because the only thing that you have to do to become an author is to write. Uh, and I know that might sound a little obvious, but here's the thing. Every time you write something, you get better at it and it gets easier. So if you write a lot, like if you write every single day, you get better and better and better and better. And you know, it might seem hard at first, but just like anything else you do, whether it's like right, learning how to ride a bicycle. Well, it's hard when you start, 
but the more you do it, the easier it gets, right? Writing is the same way. But I know one of the hardest parts of writing is figuring out what you should write about. Like, like where do you even get ideas for things to write about? And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is where you can get ideas. Now, I wanna start off with one of the quickest poems I ever wrote. It took me about 10 minutes to write. What happened was, uh, and this poem is from my very, very, very first book, which was called The Aliens Have Landed at Our School. And it's not just a book about aliens in school. There's all kinds of stuff in here. But what happened to me was one day uh, in the middle of the summer on a really, really hot day, my family had, um, we had rented a houseboat and we were out in the middle of this huge lake. And it was so hot that I decided to go for a swim. And so I jumped off the boat and I was swimming along in the water. And as I was swimming, I was thinking to myself, I was thinking, you know, I have not written a poem in at least a week. I should really write a poem, but what am I gonna write about? And then I thought, oh, I know, I will write about swimming. So as I swam along in the lake, I thought of this poem in my head, and then when I got out, I dried off and I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. And it, uh, oh, and by the way, it is called Swimming Ool, which is kind of like Swimming Pool, except it's Swimming Ool, and it goes like this. Swimming in the swimming pool is where I like to be. Wearing underwater goggles so that I can see. Yesterday, before I swam, I drank a cup of tea. Now our pool is just an ool because I took a pee. <laughs> And I just had so much fun writing that, that um, I thought, you know, hey, I'm gonna keep doing this. I wanna write more poems. Now, I wanna show you, see, here's the thing. You might think that you have to be like 150 years old to be an author or something, but it's not true. You could become an author right now. See, I wasn't always an author. Nah, once upon a time, I was just a little kid. Ah, so here's a picture of me. That's me right there when I was about two years old. I'm probably lying there in my diaper. Um, that other kid sitting up there, that's my older brother. His name is Ross. Um, and then that guy in the middle there, that is our father. Now, I'm sure you can see what we are doing in this picture, right? Yeah, we're reading books. And when I was a kid, man, we read lots and lots and lots and lots of books. But the ones that I remember the most were the funny rhyming books. Like, for example, the first book I ever remember my parents reading to me was Mother Goose Nursery Rhymes. I was probably just like one year old when my parents were reading Mother Goose. And these are all weird, funny, short little rhymes. And I just thought they were wonderful. Now, as I got a little older, we started reading Dr. Seuss right? Books like The Cat in the Hat and Green Eggs and Ham and stuff like that. Oh, oh, and by the way, if you ever want to read my favorite Dr. Seuss book, it's one that you might not have ever even heard of before. My favorite Dr. Seuss book was called I Had Trouble in Getting to Sala Salu. Uh, yeah, if you ever come across a copy of that book, like in your library, check it out. It's really good. Yeah. Now, as I got a little older, uh, something else that we used to do besides just read books was we used to go on a lot of road trips in our car. Okay, so, so here's another picture. Um, that's me down there at the bottom. Uh, that's my older brother, Ross, in that really weird looking coat. And right behind him is my grandma and my little brother, Danny, and my mom and my dad. And there's the car. Yeah. Now, the reason I'm showing you a picture of our car is because when I was a kid, we used to go 
everywhere in this car. Like we would go camping, we'd go on picnics, we'd go to the mountains, we'd drive to the beach. We were just like always going places in that car. Um, now, what that means is that it would be my mom and my dad in the front seat and me and my two stinky brothers in the back seat. Now, unfortunately, this was so long ago that we didn't have any video games to play with in the backseat of the car. Yeah, and it's not because my parents were mean. It's because this is so long ago that electronics had not been invented yet. <laughs> so we didn't have like any Nintendo Switches or, or 3DSs or Game Boys or any of that. Nah, the only things that we had to play with when I was a kid was we had like sticks and, and rocks and like uh, superhero action figures. Yeah, except we weren't allowed to bring the sticks and the rocks into the car. <laughs> so we would just hit each other with our action figures. Well, no, I mean, look, it's, it's not like we were doing it on purpose, right? But trust me, if you're stuck in the backseat of the car, for an hour between your two stinky brothers, after a while you start loving each other and saying things like, like, hey, quit touching me, you know? And then your brother goes, well, I'm not touching you, you're touching me. And you go, I'm not touching, hey, hey, that's mine, give me that back. And the next thing you know, we're like punching each other in the head. Now, of course, we just thought it was all great fun, right? But Parents get a little cranky when you're fighting in the backseat of the car. You know what I'm talking about. So they had to figure out some way to keep us from fighting. And what they realized was that they could just tell stories or, or sing songs, recite poems. Like, I don't know how, but my father had memorized a lot of poems and he could just start reciting a poem and then we'd all pay attention for at least the next two minutes like, <laughs> and I loved listening to those poems. Now, as I got a little older, uh, oh, oh, here's another picture. Okay, so um, that's my older brother, Ross, in the dark blue shirt. Uh, that's our dog, Rhodes, down there at the bottom. That was my little brother, Danny, in the purple shirt. The kid in the red sweater, that was our friend. His name is Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, and there's me. Now, I'm sure you can tell just by looking at this picture that my brothers and our friends look pretty normal, right? <laughs> yeah, and I'm the one that looks like I'm making plans to take over the world, like <laughs> Yeah, okay, so look, I admit it, I've always been kind of goofy and kind of silly, and I always liked making jokes and making people laugh. And then when I grew up, I realized I could put these two things that I liked together, uh, poems and making people laugh. And now this is what I get to do for a living is I just make up poems and I share them with kids uh, in my books and on the internet and in schools and online. And I have a bunch more poems I wanna share with you today. Now, this next one is, um, from my book, When the Teacher Isn't Looking, and it's called Snow Day. And uh, you, I'm sure you know that a snow day isn't just a day when it snows. It's a day when it snows so much that they have to close the schools because nobody can get there, right? Now, this is sort of a true story. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to read the poem first, and then I'll tell you what happened and where the idea came from. Okay, so here is Snow Day. Snow Day, Fred said, all play, let's sled. No school, just snow, way cool, let's go. Fred ran in shed, had plan, got sled. Go slow, Mom said. I know, said Fred. Uphill went Fred. Downhill, Fred sped. 
sled streaked on past. Mom shrieked too fast. Snow blue can't see. Fred flew, hit tree. Sled bent, Fred's head got dent. Poor Fred, he cried. Now plays inside snow days. <laughs> you know, I, I told you at the beginning, that was sort of a true story because it actually happened to me. Now, it didn't happen on a snow day exactly. It happened on a field trip. So I grew up in California where it did not snow very much. But one winter, our school had a field trip and we went up to the mountains in the snow and, and all the kids brought their sleds with them, including me, except uh, I was too scared to go down the hill that everybody else was going down. It was, I was in fifth grade, I was 10 or 11 years old and everybody was going down this hill and I was like, that looks way too scary. But then when it came time for lunch, it turned out I was so excited to bring my sled I forgot to bring my lunch that day. So everybody went and sat down and ate lunch. And I was like, what do I do now? And I thought, okay, I'll go down that hill. And I did. And I ran into a tree and I broke my leg. <laughs> and so when I was thinking about writing a poem about snow day, that memory came to my mind. And I thought, I'm going to write a poem about that. This next one is from my book, Revenge of the Lunch Ladies. And uh, I'm going to read you the poem first, and then I'll show you where the idea came from. Because, see, ideas come from everywhere. Ideas come from things that happen to you, things you see around you, things that you like, things that you don't like, even things out of your imagination. And this poem came from something that I heard. Well, let me read you the poem first, and then, then I'll show you. Okay, so this is called, I Have Noodles in my nostrils. <laughs> and it goes like this. I have noodles in my nostrils. I have noodles on my nose. There are noodles on my cheeks and chin and dripping down my clothes. I've got more up on my forehead. Some are sticking to my neck. It's completely disconcerting. I'm a noodle covered wreck. I can see them on my kneecaps and I know they're in my shoes. When I stand, they're somewhat squishy and I feel them start to ooze. There are several in my pockets. There's a handful in my hair and I'm pretty sure that some are even in my underwear. So try not to do what I did. I'm a total nincompoop. And I fell asleep at lunch while eating chicken noodle soup. <laughs> now, I'll tell you where the idea for this came from. One day I was visiting a school and I was doing assemblies at the school. Uh, but then when it came time for lunch, I went to the teacher's staff room and one teacher was telling another teacher about a student who fell asleep and spilled noodles all over themselves. And I just thought, oh, that is a great idea for a poem. See, so all you have to do if you want to be an author is pay attention. And when you notice something funny or something interesting, Write it down, turn it into a story, make it into a poem. Okay, this next one, I wrote an entire book of poems about Christmas. Well, actually I should say I co-wrote a book. So I co-wrote a book called Santa Got Stuck in the Chimney with my friend Linda Knaus, who is also a terrific poet. And I'm just gonna read you the title poem from this book and then I'll tell you where the idea came from. Oh, I take that back. This is not a title poem. This is, <laughs> this is a poem called Dear Santa, Here's My Christmas List. Okay, well, anyway, here it is. Dear Santa, here's my Christmas list. 
I hope you bring it all. I've only asked for gifts my parents can't find at the mall. I'd like to have a UFO with aliens inside. And maybe a Tyrannosaurus Rex that I could ride. A 99-foot robot is a present I could use. I'll also need a time machine and rocket-powered shoes. Please bring a gentle genie who will grant my every wish. And don't forget a wizard's wand and, yes, a talking fish. Of course, I'll need a unicorn. And won't you please provide a dragon and a castle in the English countryside. Of course, the weight of all these things might cause your sleigh to crash. If that's the case, dear Santa, please feel free to just bring cash. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was a kid, I remember there was one Christmas where there was only one present I wanted. And that was called a close and play record player. And you would put a record in it and then you would close it and it would start playing. And that was the only thing I wanted because I saw it on TV so many times. And underneath the tree was something that felt like it was the right shape, the right size, felt exactly like a close and play record player. And when Christmas day opened, uh, when Christmas day came, that was the first present I opened. And it turned out it wasn't a close and play record player. It was a soldering iron. <laughs> My dad thought that I needed a soldering iron for some reason. And so I just thought, you know, hey, you know, if instead of getting dumb presents that you don't really want, if you just brought, if you just got a whole bunch of money, then you could go buy exactly the presents you wanted. And I figured this would be a good way to, to write a letter to Santa Claus to tell him, tell him to bring you things that are ridiculous that that there's no way he could bring you, you know, like a unicorn and a dinosaur and stuff like that. And then he might just bring you a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. This next one. Um, this is actually a little trick I want to show you. If you, if you, if your teacher ever says to you, you have to write a poem, right? Uh, here's a little trick you can use. Now, now, if your teacher says you have to write a poem and it has to be about flowers or or abraham lincoln or something like that then I, I can't really help you but if your teacher says that you need to write a poem and it can be about anything you want try this little trick write what's called the i can't write a poem poem right you just start your poem like that you go i can't write a poem i think it's really hard I'd rather go play Pokemon or football in the yard, right? And then you just kind of keep going like that. And the next thing you know, you have a whole poem. So you start it with, I can't write a poem. I don't want to write a poem. I don't like writing poems. Um, or like what I did, I started mine with, I have to write a poem. And here it is. I have to write a poem, but I really don't know how. So. Maybe I'll just make a rhyme with something dumb like cow. Okay, I'll write about a cow, but that's so commonplace. I think I'll have to make her be a cow from outer space. My cow will need a helmet and a space suit and a ship. Of course, she'll keep a blaster in the holster on her hip. She'll hurtle through the galaxy on meteoric flights to battle monkey aliens in huge karate fights. She'll duel with laser sabers while avoiding lava spray to vanquish evil emperors and always save the day. I hope the teacher likes my tale. Amazing Astro Cow. Yes, that's the poem I will write as soon as I learn how. <laughs>
Oh man, I hope you try that little trick and make, make your very own, I can't write a poem poem. They're fun. Ah, next up from my book, My Hippo Has the Hiccups. This is possibly the funniest poem in the entire book. And I'll show you afterward, I'll show you where the idea for this poem came from, okay? But this poem is called, My Puppy Punched Me in the Eye. Here it goes. My puppy punched me in the eye. My rabbit whacked my ear. My ferret gave a frightful cry and roundhouse kicked my rear. My lizard flipped me upside down. My kitten kicked my head. My hamster slammed me to the ground and left me nearly dead. So my advice, avoid regrets. No matter what you do, don't ever let your family pets take lessons in Kung Fu. <laughs> hey, you know, I want to show you where the idea for that poem came from. Um, see, this, the idea for this poem actually came from my dog. Here, and uh, let me show you a picture of my dog. This is my dog. His name is Jesse, and and yeah, I know he's like so ugly that he's cute. <laughs> he's like a like an old man with a huge head. Uh, but here's the thing: his favorite thing to do in the whole world, uh, well, besides eat, is to jump on people. Like anybody that comes to our house, he is right there going. Rah, 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 rah. And I don't know. I can't tell if he. Uh, thinks he's protecting the house or if he just wants to play. But one day I was watching this and I just thought, man, wouldn't it be funny if he took karate lessons, then he could totally knock people out. And that would be awesome. <laughs> oh, now, because I shared a poem that was based on my dog, I'm also going to share one that was based on my cat because I do have a cat. In fact, I have two cats. I'll show you in a picture in a second. And this poem um, is... Uh, from my book, The Armpit of Doom. And uh, the, the poem is called, My Parents Sent Me to the Store. Oh, I, I should tell you, you know, when I was a kid, see, I have, I have two brothers and, um, and our friend Jimmy uh, lived with us for a while because we had an apartment out back and him and his mom lived there. And we loved cats. But um, we were only allowed to have three cats each. And so that meant that between the four of us, we had 12 cats. <laughs> yeah. And of course, we were also always bringing home other, other animals. So anyway, um, that'll, that'll show you where this came from. My parents sent me to the store. My parents sent me to the store to buy a loaf of bread. I came home with a puppy and a parakeet instead. I came home with a guinea pig, a hamster and a cat, a turtle and a lizard and a friendly little rat. I also a monkey and a mongoose and a mouse. Those animals went crazy when I brought them in the house. They barked and yelped and hissed and chased my family out the door. My parents never let me do the shopping anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, that was something else that my parents used to do when I was a kid was they would send me to the store. They would give me a dollar and they would send me to the store to get a loaf of bread and a half gallon of milk because bread and milk were a lot cheaper back then. Uh, and, and yeah, sometimes I would come home with a turtle or a frog or who knows what I found along the way. Bugs. <laughs> All right. Oh, and here are my cats. I told you I had two cats. Um, the orange one, his name is Thomas, and he is 20 years old, if you can believe it. Or as my veterinarian says, he's 150. And then the white cat, that is Sancho, and he is only one year old. But as you can see, they're like best friends. Aww. <laughs> okay, this next poem was actually inspired by my children, because I have two kids. Their names are Monkey Face, and, 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 and uh, 
no wait, their name is not Monkey Face. Their names are Max and Madison. Sorry, it's that M thing that throws me off every time. Um, and, and they inspired this poem called I Didn't Go Camping from my book, The Biggest Burp Ever. I didn't go camping. I didn't go hiking. I didn't go fishing. I didn't go biking. I didn't go play on the slides at the park. I didn't watch shooting stars way after dark. I didn't play baseball or soccer outside. I didn't go on an amusement park ride. I didn't throw frisbees. I didn't fly kites or have any travels or see any sights. I didn't watch movies with blockbuster crowds or lay on the front lawn and look at the clouds. I didn't go swimming at pools or beaches or visit an orchard and pick a few peaches. I didn't become a guitarist or drummer, but boy, I played plenty of Minecraft this summer. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I wrote that poem. Um, so I have two kids. Now, personally, I have never played Minecraft. I've seen it a lot because my kids, when they were a little bit younger, they would play Minecraft for hours and hours and hours every day. And there was one summer where they never wanted to go outside. I'd say, hey, why don't you go outside and play? And they'd say, no, 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 no. I'm too busy digging <laughs> and building and running and fighting skeletons and creepers and zombies. Yeah. And I was like, hey, good idea for a poem. Oh, and speaking of Minecraft, I wrote another one too. Check this out. Uh, this poem is um, from my book, My Cat Knows Karate. And if you, if you would like to read this poem again, or if you would like to hear me read it again, it is on Simbi's website. And I'll show you where that is in just a minute here. And this poem is called Our Teacher Likes Minecraft because yeah, I thought it'd be pretty funny if the teacher was totally into playing Minecraft. So here it is. Our teacher likes Minecraft. She plays it all day. She tells us to study so she can go play. She'll dig in her mine, going deeper and deeper to fight off a skeleton, zombie, or creeper. She'll engineer buildings from dirt, wood, and stone, then go out exploring the landscape alone. She'll build and collect She'll run, jump, and swing. There's only one problem. We don't learn a thing. Ah, could you imagine if your teacher spent the whole day playing Minecraft and just expected you to sit there and read quietly? Okay, last poem of the day. This one is not in any of my books yet. This one will be in my next book. My next book is called My Dog Likes to Disco. And this poem that will be in my next book, uh, my next book comes out in May. And uh, this poem is called My Father Can't Find Me. <laughs> yeah, here it is. My father can't find me. He says that it's weird. I seem to have vanished. I just disappeared. My mother can't see me. She's looking around. She's calling my name, but I cannot be found. My brother and sister both want me to play. They're searching the house, but I've faded away. I thought that my family would all be amused, but even our dog is completely confused. I know it sounds strange, but I'm starting to think. Visible ink. <laughs> yeah, and you know, the reason I wrote this poem is because when I was about nine, I discovered invisible ink. I found out that if you wrote a letter in with lemon juice, it would be completely invisible until you held it up to a light bulb and warmed it up and then it would all become visible. And I was absolutely fascinated with invisible ink for the longest time and I wrote all sorts of stuff in invisible ink. 
Uh, oh, and if you want to read this poem again, you don't have to wait for my next book to come out. Just, uh, just drop by the Simbi website. And when you go to where you can read the stories there, just select poetry from the type of stories that you'd like to read. And you will see a whole bunch of my poems like My Flat Cat, Our Teacher Likes Minecraft. This one right down here is My Father Can't Find Me. And there's a whole bunch of them that you can read there. And that is how you too can become an author. Write and write and write and write and use the ideas from everything that happens to you. Okay, now we have, a, let me check the time. <gasps> wow, that was a lot longer than I thought it was gonna be. Okay, well, if you need to go, you may go ahead and go, but if you can stay for a little bit, we're gonna take some time so that if anybody here has any questions about writing or books or stories or poems or rhyming or publishing or authors or me or anything like that, I will try to answer as many questions as we can in the next five or 10 minutes, all right? Awesome, thank you so much, um, Ken, for- yeah, Oh, I'm gonna also, let me take this off the screen here. We don't need that there. Yeah. There we go. Here we go. So we're going to ask a few questions and then Arian and I are going to show you how you can get connected on Cindy to read some of the poems that Ken has done. All right. So, wow, there's a lot of poems or a lot of questions coming. So one of the questions, Ken, that I saw was how old were you when you started to write? That is an excellent question. And you remember, I told you at the beginning, you don't have to be 150 to write to write a poem or a book. You don't even you don't even have to be 40 or 30 or 20. I know of many, many authors who were only nine years old, 12 years old, even eight years old. But you know, when I was a kid, nobody ever came to my school and said, look how easy this is to write. And so I didn't even try to write a poem for the first time until I was 32 years old. Yeah. Uh, oh, and that was 27 years ago. So if you wanted to know how old I am right now, all you'd have to do is add 32 plus 27, and then you would figure out that I'm 39 years old. Oh, and poets are really bad at math. Perfect. So I can see some boys and girls who are like, that's not right. So that was good. So when you, when you were sharing your poem about the snow day, I made a connection to it because you said that when you were tobogganing, you broke your leg. So when I was listening to your poems, I made a bunch of connections. And I wonder if some of the boys and girls in the classrooms and on the, on the, in their homes, if they have made some connections to this is, this is like a chain and it's a connection. So if you made a connection to any of the poems that Ken shared, can you show us that you made a connection? And maybe you can tell me in the chat what some of those connections are. So my connection was when I was in grade two, we went tobogganing and with our class and we were, I was going head first down the hill, holding onto the thing. And then my toboggan stopped, but my toboggan stopped, but I did not stop. So I kept going and I returned back to school with a really cut up, really sore chin for a really long time. So that was my connection to that one. And I saw a bunch of people sharing connections. That's great. So you can share your connections with me. Sorry, there's a floaty in front of me here. So another question was, um, have any of your poems been rejected? Have any of my poems re been rejected? Oh, yes, 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 yes. In fact, here's a, here's a funny story. So uh, most of my books, I don't, you, we, like, oh, let me give you an example. Okay, my book, Revenge of the Lunch Ladies, and my book, When the Teacher Isn't Looking, each one of those books has about 50 poems in them. But I knew that not every poem I wrote was good enough to get into the book. So what I did is instead of writing 50 poems, I wrote a hundred poems for each of those books. And that way the publisher could just pick out the ones that they thought were the funniest ones. And so I always write, oh, as, as much as twice as many poems as I know are going to be needed uh, so that way they can not only reject, you know, one of them, they can reject dozens of them. And that's okay with me because I, I, I just write more. 
Awesome. So another question from someone is, um, who is your favorite poet? I have two favorite poets. I have two favorite poets. Um, one of my favorite poets, now I know, I know that a lot of people in the chat, in the, um, in, in our Zoom meeting today uh, are from Canada. In fact, most of you are from Canada. And as it happens, my favorite poet in the entire world is a Canadian poet named Dennis Lee. Now, chances are you may have heard of Dennis Lee, but if you haven't, he was really, really famous for a book he wrote called Alligator Pie. And it, it, that poem, it, it begins, alligator pie, alligator pie. If I don't get some, I think I'm gonna die. Give away the green grass, give away the sky, but don't give away my alligator pie. And I just, I love his poems. And my other favorite poet is a man named Jack Prelutsky. And Jack was the first children's poet laureate of the United States. Um, I was the fourth children's poet laureate of the United States. And oh, and by the way, Jack has a new book that just came out last month in January. Is his newest book is called Hard Boiled Bugs for Breakfast. And personally, I think it may be his best book ever. And I, yeah, he's a good friend of mine too. So is Dennis Lee. I'm friends with both of those guys. So there you go. Awesome. Very cool. I love those ones too. That was a poem, the um, alligator pie one was one that my parents read to me when I was little. So I remembered it as you were saying, it's a great poem. So um, Arian, you had a question for Ken. Yeah. One of my questions, Ken, was do all poems have to rhyme? That is a fantastic question. And the answer is no, but Here's how to decide. If you are writing a poem and you're trying to decide whether it should rhyme or shouldn't rhyme, here's a good rule of thumb. What rhyming does is rhyming makes poems feel happier, lighter, funnier. So if you're going to write a funny poem or a happy poem, it's probably best if you make it rhyme. But if you wanted to write a sad poem or a serious poem, or maybe you're just writing home about, I don't know, about uh, the flag or, you know, some, something kind of more serious. You probably want to think about not rhyming it. So there you go. Some poems rhyme, some poems don't. The funny ones usually rhyme, the serious ones usually don't. Awesome. So I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll probably need to let you go and the kids probably need to get their wiggles out. So one of the last questions that just came through on here is how many poems have you written? <laughs> how many poems have I written? Uh, the truth is, I have no idea. Um, I do know, I do know that it's somewhere between 1500 and 2000, but it's really, really hard to keep an exact count. So I don't know for certain. I could tell you that on my website, Poetry for Kids, there are actually more than 800 poems on there. Um, but, and I write at least one new poem every single week and I've been doing it for almost 30 years now. So that's why I wrote so many poems. That is a lot of poems. Thank you very much, Ken, for joining us. We have had, I enjoyed listening to your poems. Thank you for having me. And, and hey, you guys, everybody here, I, I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something. And most importantly, I hope you go and see if you can write some poems of your own now. All right, see you later. Bye. What's really cool is your voice actually helps other kids around the world when you read aloud or narrate with Cindy. So I do wanna just show you uh, how that works. And I wanna go back to, uh, here are all of Ken's poems that are on Cindy. And like he said, you can actually listen to Ken read his poems more. I know he, we've said goodbye to him already, but he's actually done something really cool. Okay, so if you click on read along, there's Ken Nesbitt. You can listen to him read some more of his hilarious poetry. And this one's one of my favorites. It's called Olympic Granny. And it's about a grandma who joins the Olympics. And I, I don't wanna spoil it, but you can go in there and listen to Ken read it. Uh, and he will, and it's, it's really funny. It's really funny. You got to go in there. So one last thing to show you, you can also narrate on Simbi, like I said. So this is how you actually go in and read out loud or narrate and help other kids around the world learn to read. 
So go ahead, um, click on those poems and those books from the Simi Room and you can do this yourself. And there are tons of books for you to choose from. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been awesome. Can I get a wave from everyone on behalf of Arian and I, um, behalf of Joyful Learning and Cindy, thank you so much for joining us and I hope that we will see you all again.